Well, thank you everyone for being here. So excited. It's Thanksgiving week. I know everyone's got a gazillion things to do. So the fact that we've moved from Wednesday to Monday and you're still here, uh, really, really appreciate that. Uh, so just to start us off, if you're tasting along, if you haven't already tasted, um, we hope that you log into mtwwines.com. Uh, pacing is gonna be really fast if you haven't already tasted. And if you are not tasting along, don't worry, this will be fun for you, even if you do not have wines. And just to uh, say thank you again to everyone who's been here. I know a lot of you, I'm just like looking at the names. A lot of you have been here right from the very beginning. I know Evan, obviously, Tim and Madeline have. This is our seventh webinar and our ninth kit. As we go into our final stretch here in 2020, thank you for your continued support. Um, so great to have everyone here. This is your wine community. My name is Lee Ming Stro, and I'm going to introduce my speakers here. Evan Goldstein, Master Sommelier, who's out of San Francisco. Evan, say hello. Hello, hello, hello. Excellent, excellent. And then we have Tim Gazer from New Mexico. Hola, everybody. And Madeline Trifon as well. From Detroit. Hello. Yay. <laughs> awesome. Do you have certified results there today? Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So for those of you who are following along, um, you may or may not have the kit and that's totally fine. Our accounts are always free online and you can just type in 111A. And if you are interested in joining the leaderboard, the point of the leaderboard is to taste along with some friends, your community here, just type in CW72 so you can see how your tasting results match up. Uh, as usual, I know we have some new people, so I'm gonna say this. And for those of you who've heard it, I hope you take it to heart. Q&A, don't be afraid to ask. All questions will be answered either live or offline, and we'll share the recording afterwards if somebody's missed this. Uh, but there are no stupid questions. I know that as we go through each month's theme, there are some burning questions. It helps everybody when you do ask those questions. And of course, virtual hugs and hellos are encouraged. Um, really love you guys saying what you are going to eat for your sides for Thanksgiving. Please keep saying hello because this is part of the community that helps us stay very engaged. Last but not least, we will have some polls today. It's a slightly different format from the last few times, but again, play along even if you don't have the wine because it'll be fun to do so. And just to show you guys on the right hand side here how to join the leaderboard. Oh, okay. So wine number one. Okay, well, before we actually jump into the wine um, itself, uh, a couple things. First of all, for those of you who've been with us for, uh, for uh, more than one session, you know that the whole format is gonna be uh, Evan, Madeline, and Tim, and we'll take individual wines and move back and forth. We flip orders from time to time just so we can get different voices in different places and everything. Uh, but this tasting that we're doing today um, is a bit different than the others in the sense that right off the bat, if you have had a kit before and you open this one, you'll notice that all of the glasses were red. Uh, usually we have three whites and we have three reds and they uh, follow a, um, you know, our particular global format, format type thing. This time you right off the bat, you'll notice that all six glasses are red. So that by definition suggests something. And spoiler alert, I'm not gonna tell you anything you don't know at this point in time, but all of the grapes, uh, the grapes, are quote unquote the same. And you know that that was in there. You don't know what grape it is. And that's why this first wine just says red wine. But as we, uh, we move through this first wine into divulge, it's gonna change the, uh, the way that we, we move through things. I would suggest to you a couple of ways to approach this tasting and then some caveats. Um, number one, because of the nature of how this particular session, the first one, by the way, we've ever done this way is being set up is it's really um, educational by definition. So if you are um, in some form of matriculation or testing program, while it's gonna be extraordinarily informative to you, it's really gonna be a lot about nuance and, and, and slight uh, aspects of stuff. Plus there are gonna be some wines here that are feeding in to that educational thing and are probably not necessarily the kinds of wines that you might find in traditional testing formats, but are nevertheless super important to the, uh, to the narrative, if you will, um, that we're gonna be needing to show as we move through here. So that's point one. Second point is that um, the tastings, and I always say this usually 
I don't start, but usually I say it sometime down the line. Um, the, the, about the wines, the way they're gridded out, as you're, you see here on the slide, and as you'll follow along through all the slides as they come forward, um, is that these are the scores that the uh, three master sommeliers uh, gridded as they put these together. Two things to think about. One, um, everybody's palate, my palate, Madeline's palate, Tim's palate, your palate, uh, out there changes every day. It's colored by what side of the bed you got up on, whether or not you've got allergies, how you're feeling, how anxious you are going into a tasting, how loose you are going into a tasting. And all of those things um, uh, will affect what you do and therefore what you score down. So I say this only to, to point out that when wines are gridded, it's a snapshot in time. It's the moment of how that wine looked, how that wine tasted at the point it which was gridded. Um, wine, unlike other beverages, like if we were doing this as, I don't know, a vodka tasting of six vodkas, which we probably wouldn't do, but nevertheless, if we were to choose to do so, they would be pretty static in the bottle from the time they were rebottled until the time you actually tasted them and probably for a long time subsequent to that. Wine, we know, is an evolutionary uh, little creature that sits there in, in, in the glass and in the bottle and changes over time. That's why we all love it. So realize as well, too, that those uh, wines are not only going to be changing from the time we bottled them until now, but also know that they're changing in the glass literally in front of you. So I do encourage you to come back and try the wines from time to time and see. Sometimes flavors pop out even more. Sometimes uh, we'll, they'll go out even less, but it's a, a really fun thing to do. The other, the only other point I wanted to make before I start this is that we taste the wines like you do, which is to say we grid the wines to a blind glass that is placed in front of us as a panel when we're putting it together. We do not have the tech sheets in front of us and sit there and ensure that everything we say is exactly what they say on the tech sheets. First of all, a lot of the tech sheets differentiate uh, tremendously. Sometimes they just respectfully cut and paste from the year before and don't even taste the wine and just slap on a new vintage. So we're trying to put ourselves in your shoes, in your glass and try and say how the wine speaks to us. So if you'll notice that if you look at the tech sheet and the tech sheet says that, you know, the oak is, is virtually not there yet it's noticeable in there, we will grid to the fact that it's more noticeable than not. So just a few caveats as we get started. So wine number one is a red wine. Um, what I've noticed right off the bat on this one is that the, the probably the biggest differentiation for me as I went through it initially versus then is the color is a little bit lighter. I think all the points are there, but the depth of pigmentation, I remember when we tasted this and it was a little bit more medium-ish, if you will, and today it's showing a little bit lighter. It's still in that ruby vein. It still has that little pinkish rim, but it appears to me to have dropped a little bit of color intensity over time. Um, it'll make more sense perhaps when we find out a little bit later what the wine is, but again, uh, and particularly uh, certain grapes really change a lot. So something to be aware of. Uh, I think all the fruit elements are exactly uh, there, it's tart, it's red, whether you call it a pomegranate, whether you call it a raspberry, whether you call it a sour cherry, the answer is yes. Um, I find that the uh, citric elements there today, the sort of mandarin, tangerine-ish sort of thing, more rindy than fruit proper, uh, is definitely there on the fresher side of things. Uh, picking up definitely some floral elements for sure. And uh, particularly the rose element really um, seems to me today more so than some of the others. Um, I think the other elements we, we, that you notice up here is I'm not getting as much of the greenness as I am today, but I'm definitely getting that, that sense of like red pepper or yellow bell pepper skin that you get, particularly if you, uh, if you roast it a little bit. Um, and all on the lighter side, just a kiss of the, uh, the, the, the um, uh, whatchamacallit, the uh, cilantro that's there. Definitely a little bit of rhubarb, something kind of green. And then as you hit the bottom thing there, some serious red licorice for sure. A little bit of five spice, a bit of pimenton de la vera as we talk about that. Um, in the mouth of this wine, it's definitely, uh, we're continuing on the aroma as well as, as taste. We, again, combine the two. I am picking up sort of an earthiness to it, sort of like freshly turned dirt as you're, as you're working your yard a little bit, just a kiss of minerality and rock. Nothing else really strong going on there. And to me, the oak is deceptive. I mean, I'm picking up as present. Um, it's, it's actually as the wine spent, has sat here and opened. It's come in, it's gone out. It's right now sitting a little bit of, uh, on the outside, but it's definitely there. And I am certainly getting um, the fact that there's, there's a little bit of contact there, uh, perhaps some, uh, some stems on this wine. In the palate, Dry as a bone, for sure. Uh, ample acidity before, uh, medium plus to high. Um, 
We call it medium plus. It could come off as high. A lot of it has to do with you. We all pick up and perceive things slightly differently. One person's medium plus could be another person's high, which is why we like to try and straddle where we can. The alcohol on this is very much at a moderate level. It's not burning my chest and it's not super heavy, heavy weight, um, uh, 1030 oil in the mouth. In terms of weight, that is not in terms of flavor, guys. There's no TDN there. Uh, tannins are, are, are on the softer side, although a little bit crept and definitely a leaner, tartar texture. Um, and the finish is, is, is definitely hanging in there. It's an elegant style of wine. It's not a blockbuster wine, but it definitely is hanging in there long. And because of that, I give it some, uh, some length, give it some medium plus in length. That's what I got to say so far. Awesome. So, go ahead, Lee Meng. So we're going to, um, for the first poll, we're going to just talk about what grape you think it is. And again, as Evan said, all of the six wines are the same grape. Um, and then we're also going to guess the region and we're going to talk more about it. So let me launch this poll for everyone to vote. You have a couple of minutes if you want to take some time. Um, in this area, you may already know what the identity of the wine um, is, but we ask you to put in what you thought it was. Uh, even as you were thinking so that there's a good teaching moment here, if you thought that was something else, another region than what you saw the identity to be, uh, this way, Tim, Madeline, Evan can explain why it wasn't the other region. So thank you for what she said. Those of you who are participating at about 30 seconds in. Evan, go ahead. Yeah, no, I, I, I hope as you've gone through this, and, and needless to say, we also um, hope and assume for those of you who are increasingly practiced in our process here that you've opened up the glasses ahead of time, that you've had an opportunity uh, to get in them. If you literally are just opening the glasses, the bottles on the fly and dumping them in the glass um, as we go through the wines, one's going to be a bit like the old proverbial drinking water out of the garden hose, but two, the wines are going to definitely be taught. So continue to give them some air, continue to swirl them around as the identities become more obvious as they uh, aerate. Yeah, absolutely. Evan, I'm just going to give you a heads up. I've already mm -hmm. seen that 48% of folks here think that it's France so far and 32% New Zealand. So mm -hmm. you've got your work cut out to definitely talk about those okay. two. Old world and new world. Yeah, like that. And uh -huh. one thought, Evan, in, when we were planning this, why did you choose Gamay and Carignan and Pinot as three sort of grapes? Are they similar? How, how would you... Well, I, I mean, I, I think that they, they, they share some commonalities in terms of pronouncement of fruit character. Um, I think they, they, they share some commonality in structure of acids. Um, whether they're higher or lower prominence is going to be oftentimes as much based on provenance of the wine, warmer and cooler areas. Um, and, they, and they share, you know, by and large, um, you know, similar, similar, for lack of better words, types of profiles. I could have put a couple of other things in there. I was also trying to figure um, globalness in there as well, too. So Great. that's what we did. Um, and, and if you picked other, we're curious to see what other variety you thought it was. So... Without further ado, I'm going to stop the polling and share the results. All so right. Overwhelmingly, go ahead. Well, overwhelmingly, people um, picked uh, the variety that, that this wine seems to um, share tremendous commonality with. Um, and uh, I will spoiler alert people and tell them that they were, those 81% of the people were right. Um, I am uh, happy to see though that some other people did that. You know, uh, Gamay is a choice. Pinot Noir and Gamay are occasionally conjoined, as we know, in a lovely wine made in Burgundy called Bastugrin. Uh, and they share commonality. They actually share likeness of character. Um, the colors are usually a bit deeper on Gamay, although the acid levels are equally sharp and the tannins can be equally um, uh, not as hard and not as gritty. Um, I, I, I put in Carignan uh, to top this off at the beginning because I've actually had a few Carignans, mostly from South America, but other places too, where you do get that sort of uh, sharpness of acid there. Usually they have deeper color. So I was sort of figuring as people were differentiating out what was going to be the case. And across all the wines, and certainly very true of this first wine, one of the elements of Pinot Noir that we know is that it's genetically missing a couple of the pigment tones, uh, pigment DNAs that other grapes are in the red wine. So you're never going to get the extract there. And if uh, certain places in the world where you travel, they actually taste you out of um, the sort of cobalt blue or black glasses to basically tell you that color and Pinot Noir is a relatively meaningless thing in terms of what the personality. Some of the most anemic looking wines can be the best. As far as location goes, well, um, it looks like our, our, our choices here 
um, are kind of across the board. It looks like France is, uh, is edging out, although there are some votes for Argentina and some votes for uh, uh, New Zealand. Yeah. And we find and out- could, Evan, when mm -hmm. you add up New Zealand and Argentina, New mm -hmm. World at a 46%. So I think right off the bat, there is sort of the decision between old world versus new world. Absolutely, absolutely. And with Pinot Noir in the old world, realize that your, your sphere um, is, is, you know, leans towards one country and one country heavily, and that country being, of course, France, um, but leans a range of wines between those that you find in the, you know, farthest north, even towards Chablis, all the way down to the south, and styles in between. Um, and they have a, you, oftentimes a pronounced character to them, certainly in what we call the terroir or earthiness, uh, depending on where it's there. Uh, other wines in different places, not so much. But there is a freshness and a brightness of fruit here and a uh, pronouncement of that character that could definitely steer one towards the new world. So let's see what it is and we can talk about it as they say, as Brian Williams likes to say, on the other side. Let me close. All right, so um, here's, your, here's your first spoiler alert of the day. This wine is from Argentina. Um, so those of you who picked Argentino, bravo on you. Um, but it's interesting because the part of Argentina where this is from is from the Rio Negro and the Alto Valle or the Alto, the high valley of the, the, uh, the Rio Negro is probably the oldest area with a history of Pinot Noir in Argentina, down in Patagonia. Um, and it's oftentimes when you talk about Patagonian Pinot Noir, be it uh, most adjacent and, and prominent in Neuquén, as well as uh, Chubut, which has got a little bit of stuff going on there, La Pampa, which you don't have much going on right now. It's considered more old worldish in style, whereas Neuquén is considered to be more Californian in style. And a lot of that is the way um, the fruit pronounces yourself. It is a 2019, which again, I think really overtly shows the, in the freshness of the fruit, realize that anything coming from the Southern hemisphere is gonna be six months ahead of us. Um, and it shows, you know, tremendous balance um, and uh, and just, you know, all the I's dotted and T's crossed. 2019 was a, a, a solid vintage in this part of the world. Um, and what's interesting here, perhaps why some people were kind of leaning towards the French thing is that, you know, down in Argentina, you've got this weird combination. This area was, uh, for those of you who follow Pinot Noir in Oregon, established very early. This goes back to the, uh, to the early-ish 1800s when the area was established primarily by the um, English going down and helping set up both irrigation, everything down here, this is dry and arid um, and is all done by irrigation uh, pumping and uh, uh, things like that, but also building the railroads down there. Um, and so they, they got the area started. The first plantings that came in were, were clearly some form of suitcase clones, but over time things have switched over. And this wine is pure Dijon clone. So this is new plant material as opposed to old plant material. And it's pure 777, which is obviously a French stalwart grape of the Dijon area of that. So if you're picking up something that might've suggested a French personality to you, it might've been in the selection of plant material uh, that's there. The wine itself, I think, um, shows the elegant side of, of the grape quite well. Um, I think it shows you, for people who are scratching their heads saying, I didn't even know they made Pinot Noir in Argentina or in Chile next door. Um, increasingly, as they get better, better plant material, more experience, and better winemaking think on it, um, it's being done better all the time. This wine's actually made by um, uh, the, that global stalwart Alberto Antonini, who's Italian, uh, Tuscan by fame but uh, has, has shared his fairy dust here, working with the local viticulture people and the local winemaker who handles the day-to-day -day in doing um, just, I think, a, a lovely job. The thing about Patagonia that probably is interesting for people and, and sort of shows why is it's, you know, obviously your next stop down is, uh, is, the, is the South Pole. So you're starting to get that sort of high, la that low latitudinal uh, numbers, but because of that, it might, be, um, it might be kind of cooler. It can be really hot in the summer, but also realize you get longer daylight hours. So you do get this interesting element of phenolic development that you're not gonna have uh, necessarily further north. So I'm a big fan of this wine, big fan of what they're doing down there and showing you this sort of elegant uh, side of what um, modern day Pinot Noir coming out of Argentina is all about. Great. Um I think, Evan, it would be great just to get Tim in here. I'm going to ask Tim to do um, one tip that um, to, to, uh, Tommy is asking for. I would love tips on assessing rim variation and how to determine the color uh, to choose on our assessment. Because these are six wines that are all red. 
you know, how do you determine rim variation? All right, that's a great question. You know, first of all, what comes to mind is that in red wine, the color of the rim or edge or meniscus, whatever you want to call it, is always going to be more evolved. It's going to be a more oxidized color. And, and you know, in this first wine, this is a very delicate, you know, pale ruby with the, uh, you know, a little bit of garnet in it. And then the rim is a very, very light, dare I say it, Li Meng, dare, dare, salmon color. Oh my God. <laughs> This is a an salmon. inside joke. Tim and I've argued about salmon <laughs> as a color. Forever. Would that be coho or Pacific? Oh, no, 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 no. Don't go there. <laughs> no, it's not, let's not go there. So anyway, uh, just to answer your, your question again. So, you know, with, with red wines, the, the color of the edge rim is always going to be lighter to begin with, and it's going to be more oxidative unless it's a thicker skin Bordeaux family grape or Syrah or something like that, where, it, you know, the, the edge rim of its young is like a really brilliant pink or fuchsia or magenta or something. But yeah. And you know what? Don't get hung up on this because this is something you note in passing. To me, what's important if you're tasting this in the context of a practice or exam is you know it's a thinner skin grape. So you're expecting red fruit dominant, higher acid, less alcohol, probably more savory secondary notes and things like that. But you, again, you note the color and then you move on. And, okay. and for those of you who are scratching your head when Evan said 777 clone, just don't be afraid because those are words that you can drop at a Thanksgiving dinner and sound super smart. Um, <laughs> but at the end of the or day- everyone goes into a trance. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> All right, moving on to the second wine, guys. And, and don't worry if I don't answer your question right away, uh, we'll come back to it at the right time. So, well, I, uh, but you know, I'm taking wine number two, but I want a parting shot on uh, Evan, mm -hmm. you know, from Patagonia, because I haven't had very many. And I have to tell you, the nose is positively exotic. Um, yep. you know, and, it, and it really does speak new world to me, but I would have no idea where to put it. So I might go to Argentina just because, uh, but big florality in this wine, both, both fresh and dried and uh, a perfectly ripe character, but also a combination of um, uh, spice that is, uh, you know, uncommon, but very intriguing. So thank you for exposing us to this. You're welcome. And, and not the sort of spice that is oak related spice. It's more variety no, it driven is, spice. But to that great point, two things mm -hmm. about Pino, since, you know, we know, and now we're marching on to others. Um, Pino to me carries a little pocket of spice along with it, uh, even when it hasn't uh, been exposed to oak, neutral or otherwise, especially cloves, and that's a personal association. And also, um, I loved what Evan said about, you know, Pino, wine in general is a snapshot in time when you grit it, but Pinot Noir especially, it's a fussy, even grumpy little grape variety, you know, and sometimes it just decides to uh, clamp up, and other times it decides to be uh, generous. So I've been. We're playing sorry, Madeline. One quick question, because yeah. I don't think that we actually explained this well enough. And Russell is reminding us of this. How would you expect this Argentinian Pinot to be different from a New Zealand Pinot? Because as you saw, the score was kind of split between New Zealand and Argentina. So Evan, back to you. How is this Argentina? Sure. Yeah. Um, first of all, I, I would suggest to you that not all. New Zealand Pinot Noir is, is created um, the same way because what you might find in Marlboro versus Martinboro versus Otago are going to be different. In my experience, um, and again, Pinot Noirs specifically from this part of, of, of Argentina and specifically, again, if I'm trying to broad stroke um, those that are coming out of uh, New Zealand, they tend to be a little bit more ample um, in, in body, in volume, um, in terms of... Uh, um, for I would say concentration of flavor, but but this first wine is very elegant. Um, and it's also because it's slightly younger vines. Vine age probably has more to do with, with the volume than not. The other thing I would I, I say my, my own experience is that whereas the um, Pinot Noirs coming out of Patagonia really tend to be driven by that red fruit character with a lot of those other elements, be it the, in, in the varietal spice or the herbal notes, or even slightly that kind of like peppery capsaicin notes that. I talked about before that, that are there in the back burner, I almost flip it for New Zealand. There I find particularly for on the South Island, the herbal notes tend to be stronger. Um, the greener notes tend to be more pronounced, whereas the fruit notes tend to be a little bit um, riper in general, but also more voluminous. Great, all right. Maddie, you're up for wine too. 
Okay, and I'm not saying 777, that's a <laughs> <Okay>, well. <laughs> All righty, wine number two. Again, just a, a note to everyone, color is part of the whole, you know, and uh, quite often I try not to get my brain engaged deductively other than thin skin, thick skin when I look at it. But to Pim, Tim's point, uh, you know, uh, I'm going to use the word salmon on the uh, rim too. I actually, you know, had said a teeny little bit of yellow, but what's very interesting, if you hold it against the white surface, it's true ruby in the center. It's definitely translucent, but you're going to get four or five bands of different colors, hues of red. So it isn't just that it lightens the hue changes. And that generally is going to telegraph bottle age and or certain grape varieties that are usually thin skinned, AKA, um, you know, and most notably with Sangiovese and Nebbiolo, you tend to see that tricky uh, color change even when they're young. Um, also, this is not star bright. You know, it's not, uh, there's, there's, uh, there's, there's no sediment per se, but, and there's no red flag here in terms of the quality of the color, but it's a little bit duller. It's not quite as, um, you know, exuberant. Um, aromatically, and on the palate, the thing that strikes me again, that laundry list of uh, tart red fruits. Um, red cherries, not black, it's really red fruit dominant. Raspberry, uh, sour red cherry, um, strawberries that are not, you know, overripe, just ripe, and pomegranate for sure. And it's pretty generous. It's meeting you more than halfway um, as you come to the glass and I, we haven't gotten to this point yet, but I definitely pick out an earthy component aromatically that I want to mention. Um, on the palate especially, there is uh, an expression of sweet citrus fruit in the form of uh, tangerine or just, you know, plain orange. And going back to the aroma, there's a beautiful dried fruit florality to this. Potpourri really sings to me on this. Um, in terms of other vegetables, you know, maybe a little fennel anise that speaks tart and uh, possibly a little rhubarb for the same reason. And herbal, maybe a little basil, especially um, sweet uh, basil or purple basil. I grow it, so it's, you know, an association uh, for me. A little bit of dried tea leaf. And then spice, it's not strong. I'm not getting a lot of... Um, uh, oak spice on this wine, though, you know, again, the oak spice is probably folded right into the, um, the spice of, um, of, the, of the, the grape variety itself. What I find very interesting, and then I'll go on to more uh, descriptive Li Meng, is there is not so much a disconnect, but kind of, uh, you know, um, they're, they're fraternal brothers, the nose and the palate, meaning they're not identical. And on the palate, the mouthfeel is, is leaning out a little bit and it's not quite as generous with the fruit as it was on the nose. There's the earth. I would say a combination of organic and inorganic earth. It doesn't command your attention, but it's definitely in there once you get the fruit out of the way. Um, oak aging, yes, but moderate. I love the blended oak option here, which means, you know, not all new small barrels. Uh, flipping all down to perceive winemaking choices, one would Imagine, you know, a uh, whole cluster with maybe a little stem inclusion and later uh, Tim can speak to that. There's not a lot of bitterness on this palette and actually the tannins are so very finely grained um, that unless you rub your tongue against the roof of your mouth, you don't even really intellectualize tannin, but certainly mouthwatering acidity. And overall, I would call this an expressive but medium to medium light bodied uh, red. Uh, going on to the structure, uh, acidity is medium plus plus for me. You know, it's really pulling my attention. I would even flirt with defining it as high. The alcohol, you know, I think medium plus speaks to it today. If I can feel it in my chest or the word alcohol even occurs to me, it doesn't mean that it's dominant. It just means that it's not invisible. It's not so perfectly folded into the wine that you don't see it. Texture lean and tart, but again, going back to that nose, it's this wonderful interplay between um, the generosity of aromatics that are not tutti fruity. Don't forget, you know, we've got spice, we've got dried flowers, we've got tart red fruit, and on the palate, it leans up a little bit, uh, though the finish tells the, the truth, the same uh, 
the same type of flavors that the aromatics set you up for. Definitely long for me and mouth watering and complexity, medium plus solidly. Um, very nice, intriguing wine that makes me pay attention to it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. So once again, we're not going to do the variety because we all know it's Pinot, but <laughs> where in the world is this Pinot from? So I'm going to launch this poll right here and everyone just take a couple of minutes to answer this, please. And you know, while we're staring at this, I mean, there's, there is France and there's everybody else in terms of Europe, uh, you know, alongside uh, the new world. But just to remind us all, you know, Oregon has, uh, has been now classically uh, named as sort of a bridge between the new world and the old. But I think that often uh, is quite true, especially in uh, the expression of the wines when they're young. To me, Oregon Pinots, if they're, they're very, very good, tend to be a little bit more restrained and not as generous when they're in their youth and they need time to open up. But you know, we talk about Sonoma, we're different pockets of Sonoma, you know, there's true Sonoma coast, and then there's Russian River, very different animals, they could be on, on different continents. Gentlemen, you want to opine about the options here at all? No, I, I, I think you did a, a <laughs> nice job setting it up there. Um, you know, one of the things that, that that's very interesting, and a lot of it is about uh, availability and things, I think it's important, I and mean, obviously we've had France so far twice, but don't forget that the old world does have other spots. Uh, that do grow Pinot Noir in Germany and Austria and parts of Central Europe, even you know places in Spain and Catalonia, and et cetera. So don't overlook that. I mean, I think we have this um, myopia that if it's made from Pinot Noir and it comes from the old world, it has to be from France, but that's certainly not the case. Oh, and, and in, even within France, we're talking All about- us, yeah. Mm -hmm. right? Absolutely. <clears throat> All right, so I'm going to stop the poll. I will tell you, Madeline, that um, there are answers across the board. Oh, yay, what fun. <laughs> So it'll be a, a fun one. Um, oh, you know, no kidding. Yeah. 31% thinking that it's Oregon, 31% thinking that it's French. Mm -hmm. And then we sort of have a little of everything, some New Zealand, some Sonoma, um, and even a little here in Australia. So shall I reveal it first or? Uh, the only thing I would, I think it's fantastic that Oregon and France are like tied neck to neck. And I would be curious if anyone wants to type in where in Sonoma, if you think it's from Sonoma, it comes from, that would be neat. Um, and other than that, I think we can reveal it. Why not? Yeah. And, you know, it's interesting. Alfred here said that the chalk and the limestone made me go to France. So let's see, Alfred. Let's see how we're doing here. Well, bravo, Alfred. So we are in uh, the southern Côte de Bonne, right? Santenay is the commune, a.k.a. the village area. And uh, this is um, a relatively young vintage, 2017. So I find that intriguing given the gradation of color. Nothing wrong with it, but this wine is it's showing a little bit more forward than uh, it actually is. Um, this is from a uh, large producer, a producer, and I, I do not say that uh, tongue in cheek uh, or with anything other than uh, admiration and respect because small is not always better. You know, this is a producer that controls, uh, owns and controls uh, a large number of vineyards. So it's, their, their quality is dependably very, very good, both for white and red wine. And um, if we were to generalize about uh, the Cote de Bonne versus Cote de Nuit, you know, broad strokes here. Um, I would say, let's say if you were tasting Latour, uh, Gervais Chambertin versus Latour uh, Santenay, you would probably have more dark fruit expression in terms of black cherry, um, maybe even some dark plum, and the tannins might be a little bit grittier, a little bit uh, uh, more drying. I think this is this wine is very true to what the label says it is, and. Uh, to remind us all the broad stroke of old world versus new world, you know, if I were to generalize, I would say the fruit inches closer to tart and dry it as opposed to ripe and even overripe. Um, there's definitely a strong sweet citrus expression. Uh, florality is important. Uh, and sometimes you get a little bit of, um, of uh, mushroom truffle expression. Um, you know, barnyard can rear its little head, but I think uh, most producers are, are careful about that these days. <laughs> Gentlemen, anything from you? Can you want to go first? Uh, sure. You know, for me, you know, there's uh, 
first of all, there's, uh, if, if I would have compared this to Oregon, Oregon would have had more fruit, more fruit expression mm -hmm. and probably darker fruit too, even mm -hmm. a cooler bit. But also the structure of the wine, uh, the secondaries, you know, there's stem tannin, uh, there's a lot of savory herbal type elements. Uh, the acidity is pretty bright and the tannins for, for what is really a lighter styled wine are pretty firm to me. And the wine just finishes really dry and sour. So, mm -hmm. and with some earthiness and there's a dried leaves, almost chalky grittiness to it, so. But you're also describing something I didn't mention, but there's a lot of complexity in this wine actually, a lot of secondary and tertiary flavors and and aromas if you keep going back to it. And I think they uh, reveal themselves in the finish. How about you, Ev? No, I, I, I have very little to add. I, I think what's nice about it is, you know, we forget how many villages there are in Burgundy and we have the tendency to obsess around a handful of them. We tend to obsess around those that are um, ridiculously expensive in this day and age. And it's nice to show people, you know, whether you're, you're showing a Santenay or a Bonne or, or something, you know, even uh, a Mercury a little bit further south down in the Côte Chalonez, that you can still find nice, flavorful, approachable Burgundies these days that are not going to per se break the bank, uh, that will provide pleasure. And for me, what I'm always looking for in Burgundy is, and I think Madeline said it before, it speaks to what it is on the label. Santenay is an elegant, lighter styled appellation. It's really as much about nuance as anything else. And I think this wine speaks to it. The one thing that is kind of interesting, and I, and I haven't followed winemaking lineage at Latour over time, but it seems that, that over the last couple of years, they pushed their fruit a little riper than they used to do. So it used to be a little bit more on the savory side, a little bit more acid and all that, but they tend to had to be pushing a slightly riper nuance on it could be vintage related too but um no spot on in what you guys said you know. but you know what let's not forget global warming is not a myth if you talk to you know people in the field people yeah. who are growing grapes and uh you know i think uh not only in uh red burgundy but in white burgundy we can perceive this in the alcohol levels just inching up half a degree can make a big difference in terms of the mouth feel and also the generosity um, dramatically. So I think we are seeing hang time, you know, mm -hmm. changes also with global warming. So I'm not, just I'm not seeing um, anyone jump in with where in Sonoma they thought it was, but just to make a comment, since there were some votes in Sonoma, New Zealand, Madeline, why, why is this not New Zealand and Sonoma in your book? Why is it not? Uh, so, well, it's not new world to me. You know, I'm gonna take it down to a sort of a simpler answer. Uh, because on the nose, um, the fruit is, even though it's, uh, it's clear expression of tart red fruit, it is not commanding attention. The other elements are singing alongside of it. That is the earth. Because I mentioned that even before I was supposed to describe it, right? Um, and the complexity to it. Not that New World wines can't be complex, but to me, you know, um, even let's say what is known as extreme uh, um, Sonoma Coast uh, is, is going to have a fruit expression that lingers and you have to sort of push it away before you look at the other elements and may not, um, may not actually show secondary characteristics without a little bit more bottle age. This speaks to, you know, it speaks to its terroir. Um, and I, I know that I had the chance to look at the label. So one look at the labels worth a thousand bucks, but there is an expression of old world, both organic and inorganic earth that I can't ignore. And I would consider Oregon, but to Tim's point, uh, you know, it would, it would have more fruit and it would have more dark fruit. How about you, gentlemen? Yeah, Tim, here's, here's a follow-up question. Would the higher acidity also point to old world here? Mm, possibly, but it's going to be, I mean, it's going to be very incrementally higher. Mm -hmm. You know, if anything, and, and I don't want to get all geek on, on people, but you know, here, what we're really talking about is the pH of the wine, you know, and if you have a high pH wine, it has a very soft palate and also lower natural acidity, right? I'm thinking about, you know, cult Napa Valley Cabernets at 15% and beyond. They have this huge plush mouthfeel as opposed to, you know, a wine from Burgundy where the, you know, the pH is low and the acid's high. So it feels different in the mouth and perceptively, you know, the acid just feels higher. So yep. as they say it, in Catholic school, it's complicated. Uh, that, that was like a 777 kind of comment. So that was um, with, on that, 
<laughs> on that note, I think we should go to um, number three so that we can give every wine here its due. Okay. Um, and I'm right. personally loving this wine. Yes. Okay, here we go. So everybody, let's uh, do the site. Uh, more color here than the first couple of wines by far. Still only day bright, some light reflected in the glass, some underneath. Uh, definitely clear. Speaks to finding infiltration to some degree. Medium ruby with, yes, dare I say it, dare, dare, salmon at the rim. <laughs> Definitely salmon. Then, I'm with you. <laughs> okay. On the nose, red fruit dominant. Um, you know, cranberry, red raspberry, pomegranate. Uh, there's, you know, sour, like, uh, red cherries that you use for a pie and even cherry pit. Uh, condition fresh and ripe, tart. Blue fruit, we're not going to find, listen, if the wine is this color, there's not going to be any blue fruit, period. So we can just skip that. Black fruit, same thing. Yeah. Uh, citrus fruit, mm, to me, actually, there's a little uh, dried orange peel here today. That's today. And by the way, my esteemed colleagues, it's. I just want you to know it's a leaf day. I just looked, OK? <laughs> I'm not sure what that means. Maybe we should all just pack up. OK, but anyway. It's um, a what day? So it's, a it's, a leaf, it's a leaf day. A leaf day. Oh, yes. Yeah, so yesterday until noon, it was a flower day, and then it became a leaf day. So for whatever that's worth, okay? Uh, floral, uh, rose, yes, fresh roses here. Also, you know, um, it's got a really uh, vitamin C hibiscus nose to it as well. Uh, a little bit of greens here, um, it says green onion, arugula. To me, it's more herbal than anything. Tea leaf, yes, more like black tea. For me, a couple of things, lemon verbena, and also uh, what else? Uh, a little bit of bay laurel, like California bay laurel, and um, chamomile. So to me, you know, once you get beyond the tart red fruit, what you're looking at is this whole range of herbal qualities, but maybe not green herbal qualities. I would also agree, uh, this is, it smells like sassafras candy, right? So this dark herbal sweet kind of character to it. And uh, yeah, there's a little Chinese five spice. Okay, next slide, please. All right, and then what else? Yeah, I would say here, you know, the earth mineral thing is a very, very minor player. It is. So we've got a lot of tart fruit and a lot of secondary savor, herbal type notes, oak aging, yes, and I would say medium. And I would say a very small percentage of new oak, and that makes us self known in terms of the spice characters of vanilla. There's a little espresso bean here for me. And, and from that, there's then the oxidative uh, nuttiness type quality. Uh, no chemical compounds, yes. And you would have to suspect that partial, I know for a fact that this is mostly destemmed, but there's definitely some stem inclusion in here because there's some stem tannin and it's firm. It makes the finish of the wine firm. Structure wise, the wine is dry. The acid to me is only medium plus today. Alcohol just at medium plus and no, you know, no more. Tannin is medium. Uh, yeah, it's kind of almost got a gritty, little bit of an astringent finish. And, and that's a combination of just the character of the wine and the stem tannins. Medium plus finish, medium plus complexity. Okay. So here we are. Once again, we're gonna get to the region and I'm gonna launch this poll. You've got your choices here. Being a bit more specific on California to go into Central Coast, um, but otherwise you have Oregon, New Zealand, Australia, and of course France also available to you as choices. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm really seeing the beauty of the um, varietal comparison, Evan. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, you know, it's very interesting and believe it or not, you, although you would think it's a completely geeked out topic uh, as we're presenting it here today, this was actually a consumer um, recommendation. It didn't come from any of our usual community. And I think they were saying that while they appreciated all of the nuance of, of bouncing around the world and learning about grapes and that for them, and this person thinks very methodically, I'd like to have one grape and really understand the grape and all of its nuances first. So I realized that, you know, we hadn't done that before. Um, it's certainly something that we're capable of doing based on the way uh, we do that. I would be curious. Thank you, Alfred, for saying so in the, the chat there. But if this resonates with you, let you, let us know. I mean, we don't we don't pull ideas out of Cracker Jack boxes. We, we, we go based on what you think about. So if this is resonates with you, thumb it up. If you say, I'd rather, you know, I really like the three, three and three, thumb it down, whatever. But, um, you know, we're trying new things too. We're not, we're not static um, here. And there was a lot of people who, um, who really thought this would be a cool way to go. And sounds like a lot of you like it too. I think, I think it's interesting also for people to jump in and tell us 
what other varieties um, would be interesting to do this comparative with as well. So if you enjoyed it, let us know, help us out here because the world of wines, as you know, there are just so many choices when we do our selections. And you know what, it's very useful to do this if you are going through a testing process because you might think you're gonna nail any Pinot Noir you know, they put in front of you, but au contraire, uh, <laughs> one can mistake anything for anything. And it, I find it frankly, as a, just a you know, professional taster, it's very useful to see different expressions of this grape variety that has you know, a classic checklist of descriptions, but you know, we're on, not even on uh, wine number four yet. And you can see what, uh, you know, how varied they are. Yeah, yep. definitely. And I also like the comment about how it's different wines from one country. So taking a terroir mm -hmm. and trying to understand different wines and how it, it works in that country. Mm -hmm. All right, so I'm going to reveal the results. You have a front runner here, but it's kind of spread out. So Central Coast at 35%, but you still have Oregon and New Zealand at 27%. And clearly no one is really thinking, um, very few are thinking that this whole <laughs> world at all. So Tim. Yeah, okay, so I guess the question to, you know, to ask yourself, you know, Central Coast, what are we talking about? So it's that Santa Barbara, probably. And I would just expect a lot more fruit and less savory qualities, I really would. Um, Oregon, you know, I would expect even more fruit than this wine too, although the savory qualities would be there. Uh, Australia, yeah, possibly. And France, uh, you know, people didn't go there. There's really a lack of earth and mineral here, you know. All right. Okay. So I reveal oh, it? Let's reveal. Yes. Otago. Dun, dun, dun. Okay. And Russell, I think I want to go back to your original question as Tim talks about New Zealand now. Uh, to see whether you see the difference in that wine that you were asking about and this New Zealand Pinot. Yeah, it would also be a great idea to go back to wine number two to the Santanae and, and see how it compares. They're very, very different in character. Um, just a little bit about this winery. Um, first of all, the winery itself is not in, in New Zealand. It's in uh, uh, Victoria. It's in the Yarra Valley. Mm -hmm. And Madeline and I, before we went live, we were talking about, we've both been to this winery. And if there's a winery that you got to go to, this is it. It's the, one of the most unique, amazing places. Uh, I think uh, Alex Shelton, who was the original owner and winemaker, sold it to Brown Brothers in 2016 because there used to be two brands. There used to be Giant Steps and Innocent Bystander. But it's in Healesville, which is about an hour east of uh, Melbourne in the Yarra Valley. It's a huge, huge wooden A-frame building that's about 50 feet tall, right? And you walk inside the building and there's an operating winery, the winery behind glass running the entire length. But what you realize very quickly is that there's a coffee roaster, an olive oil press. There is uh, a pizza place that's certified Neapolitan pizza. Cosmic and class pizza. What's that? Cosmic Unbelievable. class pizza. Yes, <laughs> unbelievable pizza. And then, uh, you know, a cheesemonger, a wine shop, it's like one-stop shopping. I, I wish, you know, it's an incredible. And plus you get to see a working winery in action while you're having pizza. Anyway, what more could you ask? Okay, uh, what can we say about this wine? Um, several different clones, the most uh, widely planted clone in Central Otago, here we go, Geeky, and is called Clone 5. And it was originally a Pomard clone that Dr. Harold Omo brought to New Zealand in 1951. He was the most important guy at UC Davis throughout the 50s and into the 60s, right? And so he took that Pomard clone, they called clone five, they developed a clone 10 slash five. And then otherwise there's some Dijon, there's some Burgundy clones here too, and there's 777 as well, okay? So uh, what else about it? You know, 15% is whole cluster, the rest of it is de-stemmed, there's partial stems, and then there's a brief uh, post-masturation uh, you know, soak, yeah, for about three days, right? 15% of the wood, it's all French, is new. And to the point that where, again, there's that slice, spice character, but the oak here is a textual uh, addition to the recipe. Uh, but to me, it, what makes it New Zealand is all the herbal and savory and dried floral qualities. And there's fruit there, but it's a secondary player in the mix, mm -hmm. okay? 
there's almost like that uh, sort of like licorice stem or fennel stem yep. uh, character that I associate uh, often with Otago specifically. The nature of the um, herbal character tends to become sort of more, more um, almost like, you know, when you have herbs and the herbs turn floral, like your rosemary starts to put out flowers there and the flavor profiles are subtler than the actual herb itself. Whereas in Otago, you get more strength, you get more, you know, almost like from the stem of the, uh, of it, mm -hmm. you know, so you, you get a, uh, I don't want to say it's pungent per se, but it's more pronounced there. Um, and to me, this one shows really classically Otago. Now remember too, if you were to get super geeky, Otago is broken down into Bannockburn and Ripple, you know, all these other areas that are, that are around like Wanaka. Um, but, but there is sort of that commonality there. Um, Madeline threw out sort of like a, a, a basil character before a basil leaf character. Imagine this again, if you take that basil, Basil, which is now sadly behind us. The summer is uh, no longer with us anymore. But if you are at the market shopping for basil in your yard, ripping basil out, and you actually pull the leaf off, but actually bite the stem, and you get a little bit more greenness mm. associated with that, more intensity of it, that to me would be which I would find in Otago. You know, this wine is very well structured too. I mean, to that point, you know, in that respect, it's a little Burgundian to me, not so much in the flavor, but I love the promise of it. And it's not giving you the, everything it's got on the palate. It's holding back. Um, and I find that uh, intriguing and, uh, you know, mark of quality. Well, we have to keep moving forward because we have three more wines to go. So oh, we're going to go to wine number four here. Tim. Okay, so here we go. As they say on TV, now for something, well, different, not completely different. <laughs> Everybody, let's do the site together. So you say this is a deeper color. Yeah, this is a solid medium ruby that lighten ups to kind of a rose pink rim. Uh, it's definitely bright and no staining of the tears and all that good stuff, okay? And then on the nose, um, this is predominantly red fruit and sour red fruit. Here we've got cranberry again, red raspberry. Uh, condition, I wouldn't say jammy. I would say there's maybe some very ripe, but also fresh. But here, what's interesting is there's a little darker fruit. And darker fruit could be clonal, but usually it's place and it's sunlight and it's ambient temperature and ripeness. Yeah. So here we've got some, you know, blackberry, black raspberry, whatever it is, it's still really tart and fresh and ripe. And then to me, again, citrus peel and flesh and here mandarin and tangerine and really high toned orange type things uh, for floral. This is definitely more exotic than your just rose petal vitamin C. And I would say lavender is a really good call here and it's fresh. More of the leafy green quality, spring peas, it's a good call. Other vegetables, I like the ginger root and kola nut call, but again, very herbal here. Chamomile, once again, sage, sorrel, and uh, tea leaf here that smells like Earl Grey tea to me. So uh, sarsaparilla, <laughs> cola, oh, yeah, okay. Um, and then we've got some earthiness listed here. To me, you know, a little bit, but not so much. I think uh, here I'm leaning toward the, the turned soil and a little bit of mushroom and that's about it. No animal, no uh, mineral. There's definitely oak aging and here it's, it's medium. And I think thus far, this has the most new oak of any of the wines. Mm -hmm. And here that makes itself known as sandal. It's a wonderful call, baking spices, smoked toast. To me, there's a, a little, you know, bitter coffee here and also some cocoa powder. And that leads to oxidation, of course, and for me, more of a walnut and a peanut shell. And chemical compounds, no, thus far we have found none. And then uh, partial whole clustering and stem inclusion. On the palate, the wine definitely dry. This is a richer wine in terms of the density and dry extract and all that fun stuff. Acid medium plus. Alcohol definitely medium plus. This is the richest of the four wines we've mm -hmm. tasted thus far. Tannin only medium, very polished tannins. The texture to me, it's round and plush on the entry, but it's definitely tart on the finish, uh, which is medium plus. And complexity, I'm going to go even a little further on this medium plus plus. Uh, it's a really, really nice wine. Okay, with that. All right. So we've got two California regions just to um, mix it up a little bit, I guess. Um, so here we go. Wine number four. You have your choices of Sonoma County, Oregon, Chile, Central Coast, or France. 
Yeah. And don't laugh, don't laugh off the France, everybody. You know, there's definitely parts, you know, places that are doing some interesting things. And I would suggest to go back in and uh, if you haven't recently, revisit some of those places that Madeline was me mentioning, they're off the proverbial beaten track. So be that, be that central vineyards, Loire Valley, um, Pinots that are coming closer to the Sancerre area. There's more Sancerre Rouge made than most people give credit for. Sometimes those can be kind of on the generous side in a warmer year, remembering that you're still reasonably inland. Uh, Alsace is really, to me, in major flux and change right now. People sort of assume because of its high and all that, that it's so darn cool, but because of the rain shadow effect there, you get some pretty reasonable sun and uh, that coupled with a uh, number of things, maybe even some choices of, uh, of clones and yields and, and things. The, the pinots there are becoming more serious. They used to be basically glorified mm -hmm. rosés. And now you have yep. these wines that are, have, have gravitas to them. It can be quite interesting. Mm -hmm. yep. So you're great to mention, you know, uh, uh, Sancerre Rouge, because that's a big player in the market. You mm -hmm. know, it's not uh, esoteric yep. anymore. I would also encourage folks to uh, provide sort of like your thought process as you're picking certain regions, why you went there. That's really helpful in helping, um, I think our master sommeliers here sort of dissect which, um, how to explain this next wine. All right, I am going to, I think having the gig is up on France, you know, no one, no one picked <laughs> France this time. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's interesting that, you know, the, the top two, if you will, is Sonoma County, Sonoma, California, as well as Central Coast. So Tim, I think explaining the difference between maybe Sonoma and Central Coast is in the order. And, yeah. uh, and then, of course, Oregon and Chile here. Well, that's a short question with a long answer. Okay, because if we pick Sonoma County apart, there are now several places that are really excelling and have excelled for a long time. We have Russian River Valley, and even within Russian River, there are microclimates there where the wines are different. Sonoma Coast Appalachian, of course, is huge. And you've got true Sonoma Coast on the west side and, and where wines rarely get beyond 13% alcohol. So they're just almost delicate with, with laser-like acidity. And as you see, swing around to Sebastopol and further east, I mean, almost to Sonoma itself, the wines are much richer, plusher. And of course, style-wise, you're right next to Los Caneros, which, you know, which is a different style into itself. So Sonoma, it could be any number of different styles, as opposed to, uh, you know, Central Coast and here I'm thinking Santa Barbara and environs. And, and, and that to me is, to me, I've always thought of those as like, the fruit reminds me of cherry pie. <laughs> okay. So it's very pure red fruited, very rose petal floral. There's a light herbal quality and there's kind of a plush texture to them, but then there's a nerve of acid that goes through and gives the wines lift. Um, so again, it's, it's, it's the Procol Harum, man, 60s. It's a lighter, what is it? Lighter shade of pale, right? Wasn't that the song? Good song? That was for you, Evan. That was for you, Evan. I appreciate Evan that. I appreciate that. Yeah. So it's definitely nuances. But here, this to me, I don't know about you two, but this has just succulent, delicious fruit to it. And oh, weight, yeah. but the alcohol is not that high. But you so, know what? Actually, the to your point, mid palate when you hold it on your mouth, there's a sweetness to the fruit uh, yeah. that could nudge me into the central coast, you know. But I noticed uh, the weight in the glass just when I was twirling it. You know, a little bit of, of an alcohol difference between one wine and another can make the wine move differently. Uh, yeah. yeah. I, I just want to, I was, I was literally about to say something and Mike Blake out there in the, uh, beat me to the punch on yep. this one. You know, we have a tendency when we talk about the central coast to focus on the southern parts of it, but in the northern parts of Monterey County, particularly around the San Lucia Highlands, that's northern central coast, but nevertheless, it, it's central coast too. And you can find um, a, a, a different kind of uh, fruit character there as well. I'm going to talk about that a little bit later. Mike. Yeah. Don't see Mike's comment was sent to the panelists, I think. Um, instead of uh, all panelists and attending. Ah. So great yeah. job, Mike. Apparently we've got some real geeks out there. Um, just, yeah. to, just to call out the identity for those of you um, who are curious what it is, this is a 2018 Pinot Noir from Sean Miner out in Sonoma Coast. Yeah, and John, uh, good shout out. Yeah, yeah, we know that uh, Sonoma Coast has been broken up and it's about time. <laughs> There's a lot of definition there mm -hmm. for sure. Yep. Okay, um, and I guess I did I share this with you guys. You guys should see this. So oh, there you go. Yeah, okay. yeah. where everything ended up. Where Sonoma, uh, Oregon, Chile, and Central Coast. 
Okay. I think it's worth pointing out on Sonoma Coast, um, just because as Tim um, rightly illustrated, it is such a broad appellation that when you see Sonoma Coast on the label, you really do need to do a little bit of digging to understand because it could be, you know, uh, it could be a very singular area in which case if there is, whether it's Fort Ross Seaview or, or whatever, it could be identified on the label. But if you blend across, you know, maybe something from the, the cooler part of the Russian River with something a little bit further north, but you don't really have enough to make a whole bottling there. And then maybe you ate it, it threw in a little bit of, uh, even Carneros is technically part of the Sonoma Coast as is Sonoma Valley, et cetera. So oftentimes these wines can be blended across the areas, but rather than just sort of saying, well, it's blended Pinot Noir or whatever, Sonoma Coast does carry a premium as far as people's brain juice and price point there. So expectation. This, yeah. Expectation. So in this case, and I, I don't know, I didn't, I didn't look it up. Maybe you did, Tim, but I would suspect that this is probably um, uh, a puzzle of two or three appellations or two or three vineyards put together that truly illustrate what Sonoma Coast is all about. Well, they just, unfortunately, I Evan, mean, they don't say, they just said uh, a selection of Sonoma Coast vineyards, and they just said, you know, a blend of Pomard and Dijon clones. So, mm -hmm. okay. and also something about, you know, enjoy on candlelit walks on the beach. So ah, you know. there you go. There you go. <laughs> Up um, by Fort Ross. No flashlights, right. Okay. So, Tim, uh, we have a question here from Eduardo. Hi, Eduardo. Was there STEM inclusion on this wine number four? Uh, if there is, it's it's very, very minor. You know, the wine has a plush texture. To me, you know, stem occlusion is just a hard green stop in the mid palate, you know, and, and I think of old school pomard when I think of uh, stem tannins, you know, but again, it adds a green and, and, and literally a stemmy quality to the wines. And here, if it's there, it's minor. It's very minor. Yeah. All right. Now going on to wine number five. Doki, that's me, right? It's you. All right, we've done such a good job describing the, um, the colors. I will try not to blow it. <laughs> no salmon for you this time, Cole, or otherwise. So if you hold the wine uh, on an angle, what's interesting to me is this is the first one we've hit that is, uh, it's monochromatic. The hue is the same from the center to the rim. And the center is like almost opaque, actually. So there's uh, quite a bit of uh, concentration here, a true dark ruby, and it lightens up to... Uh, a lighter ruby rim with a teeny little bit of violet in it. So at least in my light, and remember lights vary, right? Uh, in, in my light, it's showing young. Also, if I turn it in the glass, it is, um, you know, I wouldn't exactly say staining the glass, but it's leaving a little bit of hue on the glass. So it's setting me up for something that's got some uh, extraction, whether they, you know, worked it hopefully to death or not. But, um, you know, Pinot, we always think of it as a thin skinned uh, grape variety, but it doesn't mean it's color bereft. And then aromatically, this is very intriguing to me. And if we're looking at our, um, our grid here, it's very much a combination of red fruit and dark fruit. And this is the first time this has really occurred to me in a strong sense. It certainly has the checklist of, um, of uh, red fruits. And I would disagree with the jammy baked condition, but I would say certainly fresh, certainly ripe, not even bridging on overripe, but perfectly ripe. Um, red, sour cherry, true strawberry, but also if there was such a thing as um, a black strawberry, there certainly is such a thing as a black cherry, right? Maybe even a little black plum, black raspberry, but I find it really intriguing that um, interaction between red berry fruit and dark berry fruit. And um, moving on, there's definitely a florality once you move that fruit out of the way and you have to work for it a little bit. This wine is telegraphing young at this moment. And by the way, I learned this from my friend, Tim Gazer. Don't keep swirling it with enthusiasm because it's not necessarily going to give you any more aroma. You can even just turn it in the glass and, and sniff. But there's a uh, beautiful expression of lavender and lilac to me. I'm not sure I know what a geranium smells like or a hibiscus, but um, I love the florality, which is not dried. Other vegetable, this uh, on the palate has a little bit of a shroomy truffly character and a little bit of a root vegetable character that's wonderful. And the um, herbal characteristics, you know, the laurel bay leaf thyme speaks to me, absolutely. It's um, both fresh and dried, and it's definitely, you know, a secondary element, it's not commanding. Uh, sassafras, licorice, yes, cola, root beer, yay, you know, but um, adding just to an illusion of sweetness, actually. Uh, on the palate, 
well, we've been talking about the nose and the palate, but on the palate, this is where the earth expresses itself. You know, I think you could possibly ignore it on the nose, but on the palate, I get both, um, you know, a turned dirt clay character and also a mineral rock character on this wine. You know, I, I taste it. Uh, my, our our uh, friend Wayne Belding, who was a ge geologist before he was a master sommelier, will tell you with a completely flat voice, have you ever licked a rock? It doesn't taste like anything, but there is an impression of, um, of inorganic earth to this wine that I can't uh, ignore. Um, definitely oak, but integrated. You know, I would say medium at most, even, you know, medium minus. And I'm I'm admiring that in the wine. I think there may be some oak tannins in this wine because the tannin presence is, is a little bit, uh, you know, it's pulling my attention. Um, the oak is expressing itself, you know, not so much vanilla, but again, there's the clove that could be the fruit or could be the oak spice. And then just flipping down to perceive winemaking. Um, and Tim can also, you know, speak to this at some point. I would bet money there's some in stem inclusion on this. I don't think it's just uh, oak tannin. Um, but there's an actual little bit of a very pleasant bitterness to it um, that is different. It changes the texture on my tongue. Uh, I really find this wine intriguing and I think it's age worthy. And I also love the fact that the, it is giving us a darker fruit expression and ripe fruit uh, juxtaposed with uh, a clear earth component. Structurally, uh, acidity, medium, plus, plus, you know, there it is. You know, if you really telegraph into your palate when it's watering, that's acidity, right? Mm -hmm. uh, alcohol, you know, medium plus, absolutely. It's not deficient, but nor is it uh, screwing up the, um, the balance of the wine tannin. I would say at this tasting, medium plus. I mean, it's pinot tannin, which is finely grained, but it's changing the texture of my palate. Uh, and it's a young wine. A uh, finish, I would say actually medium plus to long, but it's textural because of promise. The flavors haven't revealed themselves. Um, you know, they, I think it's going to take a little time for that to happen. And complexity at this moment, medium plus, but my money's on it developing a little bit more and intriguing wine. Great. Jen, right. anything you guys, want to add to that? You guys know the drill. I'm going to share the poll mm -hmm. questions. This, well, while people are voting, this is an interesting one too, because here's the first thing, and, and Tim talked a little bit about this earlier, where you know, you'll have the way something attacks and the way it finishes. There's a real almost sort of voluptuous middle palate on this wine. It's It's got a roundness and a smoothness to it, but it definitely finishes a little bit lean and it finishes just with a, a hair of grit. Mm -hmm. So when you're sitting there in your... Um, you know, we always have this, these conversations when we're gritting the wines out. Do you grit on the attack? or do you grid on the finish? And I always tend to grid on finish rather than attack. I pay attention to the attack, but at the end, it's what do you, you know, it's the old, what does it leave me with? And if it leaves me with acid, if it leaves me with sharpness, if it leaves me there, there's a differentiation between the initial attack and the length, uh, the way it finishes the wine. So um, as a rule for all of you out there who do uh, follow the grids, when you do texture, pay more attention to how it finishes than how it attacks. Mm -hmm. And in terms of quality of fruit, I'd add to that, I'm a big believer in paying attention to mid palate, which is right after the attack, right when you're holding it on your mouth, and you're not even necessarily working it, but you really get uh, quality speaks to me at that moment, the quality of the fruit. Mm -hmm. And I mean quality in terms of good as opposed to poor, as opposed, you know, as opposed to dried versus uh, jammy or, uh, or fresh. So I would say there's a lot of confidence oh, in this one. A lot of Oregon. <laughs> A lot of Oregon in this. I'm waiting for Oregon, I think. Portlandia. Oh, so after five wines, you're going, where's the Oregon, right? <laughs> um, and then there's also Australia, and they couldn't be two more different places. So do you hmm. want to um, reveal first, or do you want to talk about Oregon versus Australia first? You know, I think these people are doing a wonderful job, our, our, our company, and I think that we should go ahead and, um, and reveal the wine. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Because Although for those of you who did go Australia, if you were thinking sort of in that Mornington Peninsula, mm -hmm. Geelong area, not a bad call. Not a bad call. But I really think not only does this wine tell you what it is, if you pay close attention to it, uh, you obviously listened to it and, uh, and told us what it was, and hopefully not with expectation. But this is um, a producer that wasn't particularly expressive on their 
their website other than, you know, they are claiming Dundee, on Dundee Hill specifically. Um, and maybe one of my colleagues can speak to this more than I can, but from my experience over the last year uh, with young quality Oregon Pinot Noir, um, the ones I've had from Dundee Hills, if I were to generalize, um, tend to be more on the elegant side, if you will, uh, and not as hard as uh, perhaps the ones that come from um, uh, more of a coastal or, or cooler expression. Um, I really, I'm curious whether Evan and Tim thinks that this wine, think that this wine um, is uh, singing its song as clearly as I do. And start, I'll finish. <laughs> Tim, you're on mute, but while you unmute yourself, I just wanted to ask you, you had mentioned Oregon a couple of times as um, needing more fruit. Is this actually delivering the fruit that you were thinking of for Oregon? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, and not only that, you know, it's, it's, it's got more secondary notes than the New Zealand wine by far. In fact, please uh, go back and compare it to mm -hmm. Wine Tree real quickly. And it's got, you know, twice the fruit. And, and then it's got a plusher finish, even though the finish is a little acidic, little firm. Uh, I really can't speak. I've not done enough, you know, sub Willamette Valley AVA tastings to speak with any authority. Maybe Evan, you could do that in terms of, you Dundee know, how Hill. they compare. How no, they compare I, to each other. Yeah, I, I, this is where I wish I had a couple of my really good Northwestern friends up who could who could jump in and mm. uh, and do it. I, I, I the the wines I've had from Dundee and Dundee's obviously classic traditional uh, area tend to have that sort of roundness to them uh, and, and that generosity there. But in terms of flavor profiles and, and knowing the difference between those that are coming off of the low soils as opposed to those that are coming off the more basaltic the volcanic soils, I'm, it's not an area that I would feel comfortable and confident in at this point. You know what's so, very interesting? Go back to the Burgundy. You know, I mean, uh, more and more, you know, if you want to sort of cement your own personal experience of Burgundy as opposed to, not versus, these other wines, it's very interesting because here is, you know, the classic bridge, right? It's definitely got earth expression. Um, and I'm talking about wine number five, but there's the Burgundy, right? And it's earth yeah. expression is, uh, it's right up front. You know, you're not waiting for it to express itself. You can smell it and you can taste it. Yeah. There's also I that sort of sense of uh, how minerality or, chalkiness or limestone gives leaves grit to in different which is different than tannin grit there's like grit grit from the the terroir like chalk erasers or something i think this particular fly more than any others that we've done so far really lends itself to having all six glasses in front of you so for those of you you know who are thinking do i really need all six glasses this is one of those where it's really nice to go back and forth to mm -hmm. yep Okay, so um, Evan, on to the last wine. Yeah, last but certainly not least. Um, and and I, I hope everybody here has enjoyed the progression of Pinots um, that we've gone through here. And, and this one takes on a, a yet another uh, element, another nuance, another facet of where things are going here. Um, color here pretty much speaks to the site as it says there, so I'm not gonna spend much time. What, what's uh, clear to me is again, this sort of very vivid expression of of, of pronounced red fruits, uh, cherries and, and plums and, 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 and uh, sour cherries, as well as more of the sort of red bingish cherries, a little bit of strawberry, a little bit of, uh, of raspberry character once again, uh, conditions are sort of ripe. And, um, you know, when I say to me, it's not so much as jammy bake, but that, that character of super ripe where it, where, where it approaches like pie level ripeness, that kind of thing, or, or if you're a, a person who makes crumbles or crisps or things Handy. like that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Would be would be a good choice there. Uh, no real blue fruit, no real black fruit to to speak of. You know, you could argue a little bit of black raspberry. You could argue a little bit of black cherry. You're not wrong per se, but I do do think it speaks for the um, expression of this sort of really upfront pronounced red character. And this wine to me, and I hope you probably noticed there's sort of a thread here. For those of you who've never, who've always scratched your head and said, but you know, it's red fruit. Why do you, why do you keep finding citrus fruit in it? There is sort of like an orange tangerine-ish character here as there have been in a number. So if you want to note self to self and go impress all of your friends at the, uh, at the Thanksgiving day table or towards the holidays or whatever, and you're yakking wines and want to sound even more hip than miles in sideways about your soliloquy on Pinot Noir, talk a little bit about this sort of ongoing orange citrus, riper citrus character, because it 
fits given the profile of fruits that's closer to that, then you're ever gonna have black fruit there. So if you pull out tangerine rind or orange segments or a little bit of mandarin or whatever, people are gonna look at you, nod their head, give you great, great kudos and you can move on there. A lot of floral in this wine once again, um, just a hint of, uh, of some herbals there. Again, a little bit of that fennel, a little bit of that cola nut there. And then just a lot of herbal stuff going on here. And whether you call it uh, laurel or bay leaf, a little bit of chamomile. Um, I think the cilantro, that sort of without the uh, necessarily that sort of soapier thing that cilantro gives you, but the sharpness that cilantro gives you a little bit there too. Again, some red licorice, sassafras, a little bit of five spice subtlety uh, with all those things going on. Lots going on in this wine. And then moving into the palate, um, while I don't pick up any strong sense of, uh, of earth there, there is a little bit of inorganic, there's a little bit of organic earth in there. And then the oak actually, I think is a little bit, um, to me, it's showing a bit less than I, I remember when I tasted this wine last time, it showed a little bit more there, but there's definitely subtle uh, elements of some of those flavors that are pronounced there, particularly the cinnamon and the anise and some of those spicier notes there. A little bit of partial whole cluster in this as well too comes out in the way it's pronounced. Palate is dry. Acid level is, uh, is definitely on the medium plus side and a little bit on the shrill end of things. Um, some alcohol in here, but, but not to the point where it's burning or ripping up your throat or making it seem more generous or pushed uh, in any sense. Uh, the tannins on the wine are present. They're pronounced, um, but not out of place. Once again, sort of a uh, nice lean and tart and a good solid finish on it on a good solid wine. And one that I think um, has a strong personality. You know, what I like is that if you, you know, say who you are, rip open the shirt, say you're Superman, be, be who it is that you want to be. But this wine is very comfortable in its skin and comfortable in its expression of itself. Mm -hmm. Great. A few more spots here on earth. All right. Probably not France. All right. I'll spoiler alert that one for you. Um, I should have put Austria in here or something like that, or should have put Alsace at some point in time. Alto I need to remember myself. Alto Adige, there you go. Francia Corta, Pinot Noir, there you go. This wine has a generosity on the nose that I really love, you know, and it's also layered on the nose. Yeah, so yeah. It's actually showing you um, uh, depth on the nose. That yeah. It's starting to expand on the palate as well, but my, my, uh, my glass has really opened up over the last, you know, hour, hour and a half. Uh, and also there's... Um, this that little illusion of sweetness to the fruit mid palate. I also think that if you were to look at this as like the volume meter on your, this one's the most, I mean, it has the most volume in the nose. It's like if, if everything else has been somewhere between, you know, as low as maybe two to three on like that Argentinian Pinot Noir and the subtlety there, this one's pushing like an eight, you know, I mean, it, it definitely has some volume in the, um, in the, in its intensity. I can see yeah, also the highest alcohol. Yeah. I can see that people are slowing their answering of this one. Uh, just drinking at this point, Lee Man. Giving people pause while we're waiting for that. I've been holding back on this one question, Evan. And I know that I'm looking at my six bottles and they're not finished. And we have a question here from Tony Harris um, that we, I would love to answer while we're waiting for people to answer. Um, are these wines bottled with gas and how long will they stay fresh after the initial opening? Yeah, the, so the, our entire process um, is, is based on um, rapid movement of the wine uh, from the 750 milliliter bottle from which it comes uh, into the 180, 187 ml in which it goes. That entire process by bottle takes probably about 40 seconds, obviously presuming the wine's been you know, uncorked or quickly checked or whatever, but it moves very quickly. It's done completely under gas the entire time. So as wine is being lifted, um, space, the headspace of the wine is replaced by gas there too. So for those of you familiar with that, um, product like Private Preserve that looks like a WD-40 can that you sparge into your wine. The whole idea there is that the nitrogen, um, I believe it's mostly nitrogen, but nitrogen argon compound there literally sits like a fog bank and prevents your wine from touching air. We do essentially a similar thing, but obviously in a, in a, in a different format. And then the bottles themselves are cleaned and sparged with, uh, with inert gas. The wine goes in, it's topped, it's capped. And imagine if you're doing three of them in 40 seconds, you're talking less than 15 seconds to get it into the bottle and get it capped. So that means that the wine is very secure and very sound. Um, we do lab analytics there and can certainly guarantee 
that the wine will hold up for no problem for multiple months. Uh, the manufacturer suggests that you could hold them as long as two years. I don't think I'd push it that long. I don't think Li Meng would let me hold inventory that long. But what I will tell you is that my, uh, she's nodding her head there, absolutely NFW. But what I will tell you is that my experience on these wines, like anything else, like any 750 that you would be bottling or Magnum that you might be bottling, you need to let the wines sit after bottling. So we let them uh, hang in the warehouse um, in little stacks for upwards to 30 plus days before they get packed and before they get shipped. And you know that when we ship them to you, we ask you to hold on to them for five to seven days before you open them. Because wines like us don't like to get chucked up. They need to relax and be quiet. Having said that, my own personal experience in tasting through a lot of the older bottles um, is that they really start to hit their sweet spot at about six months, which if you do the old uh, adage of, you know, uh, 20 minutes in the glass is worth X amount of bottle age, um, number one, you've probably been, um, as you're going back and retasting these wines, noticing they're opening and getting more and more um, uh, complex and interesting as they sit out there. That will be the case for the remainder of the day today and probably arguably even in tomorrow, depending on the volume of wine, you have left or not, but even untreated, they probably hold well till certainly tomorrow morning, wine for breakfast. But if you treated them with gas or something, they would hold well for, uh, for uh, you know, several days and probably more so if you only opened it one more time. You yeah. know what I think is a great testimony to your process, Lee Meng and Evan, is the fact that when I open my bottles uh, every time I've done this and, and poured them out and walked away for no more than five minutes and come back, the wines are true aromatically. And I, I find that thrilling because I don't think that that's the case with some other preservation systems. Mm -hmm. uh, so whatever you're doing, yay. Keep on doing. So I just wanna show those who don't have the bottles, these are screw capped. And as Evan said, the liner in the screw cap holds the wine for about two years but our profiles were comfortable with only using the profiles for a year. And once you open it up, you can use the preservation system, but if you didn't open it, it is good for a year for sure. Yeah. All right, let me show you guys the results. Uh, people are getting super focused. I think they're thinking <laughs> Evan, that you're not gonna show the same region twice. I'd so, probably be right on that. <laughs> absolutely. So sharing the results, we have half, uh, or 65% of the folks thought it was Austra uh, was, was Central Coast and 35% thought that it was Australia. Mm -hmm, so, mm -hmm. so on the Australian ones, I, you're probably doing that because it's the, one of the regions we haven't hit yet. And I appreciate that. Um, in my experience in tasting Aussie um, Pinots from, from be it Yara or from the aforementioned Geelong, Mornington, et cetera, they don't have the strong uh, herbal note that this one has. And they do have that sort of vibrancy of red fruit. Uh, they tend to be a little bit more generous. So that's a good call to make there in terms of the alcohol. But this last wine is, and might as well go ahead and show it, Li Meng, um, from the uh, Central Coast and from the Southern part of the Central Coast, uh, from a very well-established a winery in Fox and Winery that's been around since 1985, which is literally four years after uh, the appellation itself of Santa Maria was codified as an AVA in 1981. It's some of the older plantings in that part of the world that comes from a single estate. Uh, the Rancho uh, Tinguakik, I probably pronounced that wrong, but I'm sure it has to do with uh, native people who don't wanna have me pronouncing their wines anymore. But nevertheless, what's interesting about it is it's an appellation that sits in the very Northern part of Santa Barbara County. Um, Santa Barbara, as we know, is got Santa Barbara, you've got Santa Maria, or STA, you know, you've got the STA, Rita Coast, uh, Hills rather. So you have different things there. So it's not sort of monolithic, but to me, um, if we were talking a little bit earlier about how these wines rate out, this is probably closer to me to Santa Lucia Highlands um, than it would be to other places there. Um, I, I find that it has, as uh, Tim alluded to, Central Coast, Southern Central Coast wines share the sort of bright red fruits, a lot of cherry, et cetera. There's usually an earthier type of component there, but always that sort of underlying um, herbalness to it. To me, what I look for when I'm looking for Santa Maria is a lighter body weights. Uh, this is definitely pushed a little bit on the riper side, which is probably in large part due as well to uh, vintage 17 had, um, uh, if you remember, very small amounts. It was about a half normal harvest there. So the fruit that was left was quite concentrated in nature. The acids tend to be uh, bright uh, and almost electric as this wine I think showed you and as Tim mentioned before. And you do get these sort of earthier component notes, but not necessarily in the truffley thing, 
but more into like a spicy earthiness, like um, like the roots of, of spices and things like that that you get that are there. Um, the, the gentleman, uh, Bill Wayven and Dick Dorr, who have had this winery since its inception, year in, year out, do a great job. It's one of the most um, uh, quintessential Santa Maria wines that I have there, which is one of the reasons why we uh, picked it. But uh, I think it's a nice way to finish up uh, here and to take us around the world. I know people are probably docking me points from not giving you something from, you know, Southern Germany or some other places. But next time we do Pinot Noir, all the Only six possibilities. I know, only six options. Um, so um, couple of questions. I guess for you guys, do you see the difference between this um, very marked difference between the two from California, Sonoma Coast versus Central Coast? To me, well, again, and it's hard to say because my, my guess is without the data in front of me, that this the Sonoma Coast one is literally jumping Appalachian. So I think there's probably a piece of it that's true coast. I think there's a piece of it that's probably true Russian River. And I, I would I would even venture out as far to say as maybe there's something Carnero C about it. So in terms of trying to pull together a profile when you're mixing three things so disparate, it's hard to do. I will tell you that the nature, especially as you approach the water, and this this particular one, you know, this area of Santa Maria is like literally, I want to say like seven or eight miles from the ocean. So it's very, very cool in that regard. And you get to that acid there. But the nature tends to be herbs, where to me, when you start pushing the coast up north, it tends to be more conifer, more pine cone, more, more almost associative of the type of uh, of, uh, of uh, flora that you get up in the area. Whereas here, it tends to be more really about herb. I think, so too, I think too, Evan, go back to how you described the nose, which you did beautifully. You know, there's there's a uh, ripe bridging on overripe, and I jumped in because I wanted to say candy. Mm -hmm. uh, so that that, uh, that that it's both on the nose and mid palate that to me speaks this growing region. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. on a more primal level, even before, and I don't get that from you know cool pockets of Sonoma mm -hmm. Coast as much. Uh, so that, you know, and some people will turn their nose up at that because frankly, wines like this are positively delicious. They kind of are, are very generous in giving you what they've got, which this nose is, uh, is doing for sure. They're up front. But I, I think that, um, that sweetness of fruit is not to be discounted with this growing region. We have two more questions that I definitely want to get to. The first one before I flip the slide, and then I'm going to answer the second one with this slide. Um, John basically read our minds, Evan, on, on gifting. Um, mm -hmm. But first, Eduardo, of these six Pinots, which would you recommend for Thanksgiving? Oh. Oh, we were just talking about that. Um, for me, and everyone's going to have a different, a different thing about Thanksgiving. And by the way, there's that wonderful movie. I'm trying to remember what it was. It's one of those food movies of years ago where they actually showed six different Thanksgiving Day tables, depending on what community and where you lived. And, and it's it's a fascinating element to see how people celebrate Thanksgiving because it's not turkey everywhere you go. Um, so that is obviously going to drive it. Turkey, presuming you're like classic American Thanksgiving with the roasted turkey and all that, the bird itself is relatively meaningless because, you know, even compared to say other small birds, dark meat turkey compared to say a dark meat uh, free range chicken compared to say squab or something like that is relatively mild and, and the white meat is pretty mild too. So I always tell people that, 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 that turkey is basically like, you know, uh, a, a big swab of cotton in the shape of a bird, right? There's not a lot going on there. So your pairings have to do with ever, the, the, I mean, yeah, imagine like taking a big ball of cotton. That's really what turkey is, right? So everything else that you're eating with is really what it's about. So what kind of stuffing do you have if you're a person that does stuffing? What sort of accoutrement, we were talking about, you know, sweet potatoes. Do you do your sweet potatoes like curry? Do you do them with marshmallows? Do you do them with orange juice? How, you know, so I would plan my meal around that. Having said that, for me, I find that the subtlety of Pinot, like the last wine we just had and the Oregon wines would be the types of Pinots I would probably have with Thanksgiving if I was going the Pinot route. Because I think you do need something that's got some personality. The dishes are richer in general and the acids, while they're gonna cut there, a lot of the nuance and elegance is going to be lost. My choice of wines generally towards Thanksgiving tend to be bigger red wines, but wines that have had time for the tannins to calm down, a lot of bottle age on them. It also shows my love for the people that I'm dining with to pull out wines that are 15, 20, whatever years old. But it's as much 
as a self-preservation thing to ensure that the tannins don't overwhelm the flavors. Um, they vary between new world and old world. Um, and the other thing is not to overlook white wines at the Thanksgiving day table, particularly given the turkey, some of the bright uh, sweetness things that we talked about before. Anything is far-fetched as a uh, good off dry Riesling can be fabulous at table to um, certain white rones. We talked about those at a tasting recently somewhere can work well at table as well too. But uh, remember that, that um, Thanksgiving is not monolithic and what people serve for Thanksgiving is not monolithic. More than one bottle on the table. I would pick the Patagonia wine because A, it smells wow. like a million bucks even now and it's intriguing and exotic. And I would tell people just Selfishly, if you're sitting there drinking Pinot with Thanksgiving, don't have a mouthful of the <laughs> marshmallow, sweet potato, cranberry stuff, and then go to the Pinot glass. You right. know, that lovely sage dressing with the cotton turkey. <laughs> Evan, I'm not sure your mom would be okay with this cotton. Uh, uh, no, we've had that conversation before. She knows my feelings. Um, so I, I wanted to address John's question, which is about gifting. Uh, first of all, happy Thanksgiving. We're so excited that you guys decided to take a Monday afternoon to spend with us. We really appreciate that. Uh, share the love. Mastering World is certainly growing, but we could use even more help to grow. So I appreciate that, especially going into the holiday season. We do have a Black Friday Cyber Monday deal. For those of you who got an a la carte just to try us out, obviously, we would love for you to subscribe. And so $15 starts you off in a really good place um, on gifting. So um, the gift thanks um, uh, code is going to work starting as soon as you get our, uh, um, our email uh, that has the recording. And for everybody else, we're going to release that code only on Thursday. So definitely get in early and get in fast to use that code because we are going to put limits to how much we can sell because there is only so much we have. Um, on gifting, if you are interested in the Pinot Noir kit, we do sell them a la carte as gifts. In the note section, you can note, I would love to give the Pinot Noir kit. Unfortunately, besides this Pinot Noir kit, we don't actually have um, a lot of the past kits. We, we do sell out. Um, as Evan has noted, we run a very tight ship on inventory um, to manage our finances. So we do sell out every month, um, but there are some Pinot Noir kits left if you are so inclined for gifting. Otherwise, we'll be shipping you the next kit, which is going to start shipping next week. We also have an exclusive Faux Piano Winery. Um, it's, it's our turn to give thanks to Faux Piano. Uh, Evan and I have the pleasure of working with Rob, Nova, some amazing people, Heidi over at Faux Piano and Paul, um, who have really allowed us to grow our business while um, using their facility as our O2 property. So um, as a, a way to give thanks, we've made a Faux Piano kit to celebrate their 125th anniversary. And that is going to start going on sale this week. It is talk about trying to taste six different varietals, all from one winery. And, um, you know, there'll be a lot of fun trying to spot the Petit de Ra, which is their signature in five of those uh, red wines. We also have a Wine and Spirits Top 100 kit. We still have those to sell. Uh, we definitely made a lot of fun ones of those because uh, it's the top 100. So Josh Green had picked six wines. There are recordings for these particular six wines if you go to Wine and Spirits' website to try out. Um, and there are two, I would say, really amazing. We don't usually tell you guys what the wines are, but in this case, we've actually listed what the wines are if you, if you want to know before you purchase. There are two really amazing Syrahs, for instance, and a Tanat from Uruguay as an example in that particular kit. Um, and then again, the gift thanks works on any subscription. So whether you're trying to go for an annual or a monthly, uh, we'd love for you to do that. Last but not least, because of the holiday season, we are pulling forward. So for those of you expecting us to be back in December 20 something, we are actually back on December 15th. And we're back to a global selection. I'm super excited about the selection, Evan. I thought, I mean, I always think that you make a good selection, but this one I thought was a really, really fun one upcoming. Oh. Well, uh, wishing everybody the happiest of turkey days, regardless of what it is that you're eating and drinking. And thank you all for taking time um, doing this with us today and not making lists and going shopping already. Remember, it's going to get really crazy out there in about 48 hours. So shop early or shop online. 
And uh, thank you to my compatriots in crime, Madeline and Tim, as always, uh, you are the best. Uh, Li Meng, thank you for orchestrating this perfectly as you always do. Andrea, behind the scenes for making sure that we don't completely screw up uh, and everybody else who's involved there on uh, Team um, Master of the World, wishing you all the greatest of, uh, of Thanksgivings with your small families and small groups. Um, remember that we do have a lot of things to be thankful for regardless of how crazy 2020 has been. For starters, every time we do this webinar, I feel like I forget the world out there for about an hour and a half. So oh, thank well you. Said. What could be better than that? Stay safe yep. uh, with your loving pods. <laughs> yep. Bye-bye. Best to everyone. Bye-bye, everybody. Have a wonderful Thanksgiving.